Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, shout out to the, the band this morning. Um, man, thank you so much for serving us um, in, in that way. Um, thank you so much. Absolutely amazing. And then uh, shout out to Kumo. Yeah? Well done. You, uh, you did that so much better than some people. I'm not going to say their names, but they know themselves. Um, but thank you so much for serving us and reminding us of who God has called us to be. Um, good morning to everyone who, uh, is, if this is your first time uh, canvassing the room, uh, it's always difficult with mosques on, but if this is your first time, I know Jono has welcomed you, but uh, let me welcome you to Rooted Fellowship. It's a, it's a joy to have you here this morning. We counted a, a privilege that you would consider uh, Rooted Fellowship uh, safe enough for you to come and uh, seek to understand a little bit more about who Jesus is, because uh, that's who we are about. Uh, we center ourselves around the truth and the beauty of the gospel that is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're uh, happy that you're here, and uh, we hope that you get to experience uh, some of those things that Gumo uh, shared to us, the fact that we are gospel-centered, that we're disciple-making, and that we are transcultural. Uh, to all the regulars, uh, it's good to have you guys here again. Uh, we are in part nine, as, uh, as Jono said, part nine of our sermon series in the book of Exodus. And um, chapter 18 is where we're going to be. So if you have your Bible, you can meet me there. Chapter 8. This passage is, uh, is fairly well known uh, in the church circles. Um, it's usually preached at leadership conferences. Um, this chapter will make its way into leadership books uh, because it speaks of leadership. It's quite obvious. It's quite plain. Uh, Jethro, who is Moses' father-in-law, shows up and gives him some advice. He gives him some wisdom, uh, some leadership kind of guidelines uh, to how he can continue to serve and lead the people of God. And so uh, if you are familiar with this text, I'm going to say some stuff that you've probably heard before. Yet at the same time, I'm going to try to unearth what I like to call golden nuggets that maybe you haven't seen before, but are beneficial for us to hear and implement in our lives. All right. So Exodus 18 is where we will be. And I'm going to do it similar to what I did last week, uh, where I'm just going to walk through the chapter uh, and we'll pause at certain places and I'll try to unpack what's going on there and give you some practical tools on what that means for you. If you are a Christian, then what that means for you in your everyday life. All right. Is that okay with everyone? Fantastic. Let me, uh, let me pray for us. Uh, before we jump in. I know Jonah prayed for me, but it's never a bad thing to pray some more. Um, and so I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me, uh, that God would do something more powerful than we could ever imagine right here in this very moment. And so let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for your word. These are ancient words, but they are not dead words. They are very much alive. And so Lord, I pray that as we hear them, that they would transform our lives that we would see much of you, God. That we would recognize that we are loved more than we could ever imagine, and that is evident because of the finished work of Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you lead this time? Open up our minds. Open up our hearts. Lord, I ask that you would stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Exodus 18. 1. Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, heard about everything that God had done for Moses and for God's people, Israel, when the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And so now word is getting out of what God has done in and through his people. And so it ends up landing on Jethro's doorstep. He hears about what God has been doing. Now, look, I love Jethro. Uh, you'll see why in a moment. 
but one of the other reasons that I, I'm not going to preach, it's not in, in the text, uh, that I love Moses, is, I mean Jethro, is, is because he's so relaxed. He's such a chilled individual. I mean, if we go all the way back to Exodus uh, 3, where Moses uh, encounters Jethro in um, 2, 3, 4, where we see him, he's introduced to us, we actually see how relaxed he is, how chilled he is. Moses is, is tending to Jethro's flock, sees a burning bush. God speaks to him, tells him he needs to go back to Egypt and deliver his people. They go back and forth. Moses ends up realizing, I'm not going to win this one, which is a note to you. You will never win when you stand toe-to-toe with God. So he realizes he's not going to win this one, so he decides, okay, I need to go back to Jethro to tell him I need to go back to Egypt. So he goes home to his father-in-law, and he says, I need to go back to Egypt to go check uh, on my family. That's all he says. He doesn't tell him why. He doesn't tell him what happened with the burning bush. No, he just says, I need to go check on my family. And Jethro goes cool. All the best, buddy. I'm not going to ask any questions. I love that about Jethro. He's the kind of guy that says, you know what, if you're not going to tell me, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to ask. I love that because so many of us, we will we'll show up to people and we'll, we'll give one-liners, not telling them everything, hoping that, they, that they'll ask, but why? Why don't you just tell them? Just tell them. If you want to come tell me something, just tell me. Because I'm not going to ask. It's probably one of the things that my wife finds frustrating about me. She'll say something. I'll be like, oh, okay, cool. This sounds great. But you're not going to ask me why. I figured you would tell me. So chilled. Verse 2. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken in Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back along with her two sons, one whom was named Gershom, because Moses had said, I have been a resident alien in the foreign land. And the other, Eliezer, he said, the God of my father was my helper and rescued me from Pharaoh's sword. Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, along with Moses' wife and sons, came to him in the wilderness where he was camped at the mountain of God. He sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, I'm coming to you with your wife and your two sons. And so we see here Moses being reunited with his family, Zipporah and his two sons. Now, now, where were they? Why were they not with Moses? Why with Jethro? What what was going on? Now, a lot has been said about this. Some say that Moses sent his wife and children back home, maybe during the plagues, because things were getting intense. Others say, no, 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 it's after uh, Israel had made its way beyond the Red Sea and now Moses was trying to figure out how he was going to lead these people. And again, it's, it's chaotic and it's too intense. And so he sends his wife and children home. We're not really sure why, but they were sent home. Isn't this common for us? That when things get tense for us, when things become chaotic, when we become busy the first people that we throw out the window is generally our family it's our family that loses out on us because we're we're in tick i can't handle the pressure and so family to go to the back go visit your parents go on holiday just go and not just our blood family but we do this to our blood bought family when things get busy all of a sudden we don't see you anymore we don't hear from you anymore it's almost like I'm hearing of all that's going on with Moses and God's people and he's, you're here Zipporah with the kids no no pack your bags we're going back we're going back And so we see that. What we see in the text also is that this is the first and only mention of Moses' second son, whose name is Elysia, which means the God of my father was my helper and rescued me from Pharaoh's sword, which suggests to us that some things had been going on in Moses' heart, a rekindling of faith, if you will. 
Remember, his first son, Gershom, which means I have been a resident alien in a foreign land. Uh, this was probably because he was wrestling internally. I'm not Egyptian. I'm an Israelite, but I don't really feel like I belong. I just, I feel like I'm always in a foreign land. This internal torment. And so he hands that over to his son. But here, in his second son, a rekindling of faith, he, he recognizes all that God has done in and through him. Our names matter. Our names matter. We also see here that Moses had a special relationship with Jethro. We'll see that even more clearly in verse 7. But he had a special relationship with Jethro. This is why he listens to the words of Jethro. We'll see this as we make our way through Exodus 18. But he listens. He listens to the wisdom of Jethro. Now, now think about this for a moment. This is Moses, educated in Egypt. At that time, probably the most powerful nation to the known world. He had been educated by the best on ast astrology and geography and Bible. He knew it all. Science. I mean, I mean, Moses knew it all. And here we find him listening to this high priest of Midian. A man who had a couple sheep. I believe the text is telling us here that, that we need to be careful that we don't elevate earthly wisdom over heavenly wisdom. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't uh, try to get all the accolades that your heart desires. Don't, go get your PhDs. Cum laude your PhDs. But as the church, we should be careful that that is not the metrics that we use to then say, well, then you are definitely someone of great wisdom, of great kingdom wisdom. We elevate people to positions of leadership based on the fact that they're really great at biology, but know very little about the word of God. We should be careful. We should be careful. Jethro was the priest of Midian and likely a descendant of one of Abraham's other children. Now, this may come as a shock to many of you, but hear me out. I'm going to try to unpack it to you because it is incredible, absolutely incredible. Now, we covered a little bit of this in part three of our sermon series. I would encourage you to go back and listen to it if you weren't here or don't remember where I showed you that Zipporah was of African descent, a Kushite woman. I don't have time to unpack that, but, but you can go back and listen to that message. And I, I say that because her father was of African descent. See, Jethro was a descendant of one of Abraham's other children, through a woman called Keturah. And so because of this connection with Abraham, we have good reason to believe that he was a true priest and that he worshipped God. Because there's some debate on whether Jethro was a believer or was he a pagan. I believe he was a believer, a true believer. That he trusted God because he was a descendant of Abraham. But let me quote you, someone who's far more intelligent than I am. A man that I've come to know and has become a really good friend. His name is Pastor Zerubbabel Mangustu. An Ethiopian pastor. And here's what he says on the matter. Speaking of the fact that yes, Esther was a true believer and that he was African. I quote, It is understood that circumcision was given to Abraham as a sign of the covenant for him and all his descendants after him. The question then is, how could Zipporah, an African woman, 
have known its importance and used it to intervene in Exodus chapter 4. Remember, I preached on this, Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 to 26. This is after God calls Moses. We have this this kind of weird part of the text where uh, he's with his wife. They're camping out. They're on their way back to Jethro eventually to go to Egypt. And then the text tells us that God wanted to kill Moses. This is strange. You've just called Moses for service. Now you want to kill him? Well, if you remember, it was because Moses had failed to be obedient with regards to to circumcision, this this practice, this command that God had given to Abraham and the generations after to circumcise their firstborn. He had failed to do so, probably because he had grown up in Egypt and it just wasn't something that they did. And so when he left Egypt, got married, had kids, was just kind of like, ah, I've never really done this. It doesn't really matter. God says, no. Even if I have called you, you are still to pursue obedience. And so he says, no, 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 then I'm going to kill. Zipporah steps in, circumcises Gershom, takes the foreskin and then rubs the feet of Moses. Super weird, but it's in the text. And and then she says, you are the bridegroom of blood to me. And we made the connection to Jesus, the church. If you remember it, great. If you don't, go listen to it. But, but this, is, this is what Pastor Zerubbabel is referring to. How? How would Zipporah have known to do that if she had not seen her father doing that with his kids and, and then commanding those that were part of that community to do likewise? It's because it had been passed down to him. See, Abraham was the father of faith and the father of the children of Israel. And so in Genesis 18, verse 19, Abraham was instructed by God to command his children after him to keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice. Abraham became the father of Isaac, who became the father of Jacob and Esau. Jacob would become the father of 12 sons who would go down to Egypt and multiply. Many of us know this story. But what we probably don't know is that after Abraham's wife, Sarah, died, the scripture tells us that Abraham took a second wife. See this in Genesis chapter 25, and her name was Keturah. Genesis 25, let me read from verse 1. It says, Abraham married another wife whose name was Keturah. She gave birth to Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and Dedan. Dedan's descendants were Asherites and Letushites and Lumites. Midian's sons were Ipha, Epha, Hanok, Abida, and Alda. These, hear this, these were all descendants of Abraham through Keturah. What we read in Genesis 25 in the first four verses is the fourth son of Abraham and Keturah was Midian. Midian was the father of the Midianites, of whom Jethro was a descendant. Guys, are you are you making the connections? It's all in the Word of God. And it was this Jethro that was the father of Zipporah, who would become the wife of Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And so the question then is, if Zipporah's line can be traced back to Abraham, just like Moses, where did Zipporah get her Ethiopianess, if you will? Where did she get it from, if not from her father? And where did he get his Ethiopianess, if not from his father? And so on and so on until we got to Keturah and Abraham. But we know that Abraham was not from Ethiopia. Now, there is, of course, various possibilities of intermarriage throughout the generations, but it is highly plausible that Abraham's second wife, Keturah, was African, a Kushite. Highly plausible. Therefore, Jethro was of African descent. Don't don't miss it, friends. Don't miss it. 
Therefore, Jethro was of African descent. Let's keep going. Verse 7. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down, and then kissed him. Even though Moses was now the the leader of the nation of Israel, he still honored his father-in-law, Jethro. He was putting into practice the fifth commandment before it became the fifth commandment. He honored him. He bowed down and kissed him. They had a good relationship. They asked each other how they had been and what went, and then went into the tent. Moses recounted to his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardships that had confronted them on the way and how the Lord rescued them. Jethro rejoiced over all the good things the Lord had done for Israel when he rescued them from the power of the Egyptians. Blessed be the Lord, Jethro exclaimed, who rescued you from the power of Egypt, rescued the people from under the power of Egypt. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because he did wonders when the Egyptians acted arrogantly against Israel. What a testimony, Jethro says. That this is strengthening my faith. That I believe, I believe in God because of that which I have heard from those who have gone before me. And this testimony only strengthens my already faith. Verse 12, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in God's presence. They then tabled together. You want to know if you have a good relationship with someone? Have you tabled with them? Verse 13, the next day Moses sat down to judge the people and they stood around Moses from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw everything he was doing for them, he asked, what is this you're doing for the people? Why are you alone sitting as judge while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses replied to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. Whenever they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I make a decision between one man and another. I teach them God's statutes and laws. Now, we can imagine with such a large group of people, there must have been many disputes and many questions. People trying to figure out how how are we to interpret this statute or or this situation? What are we to do? So-and-so stole my chickens. What do I do now? on and on and on. And so Moses, as the only recognized judge in the nation at this point, therefore had the job of hearing each case, and he would do so from morning until evening. And because Moses knew the word of God, because he had a close relationship with God, he was the right man to settle these disputes among the children of Israel. Yet taking all this responsibility to himself was a massive burden. And Jethro observed this. And so he asked him, what are you doing? Moses, what what are you doing? Verse 17, what you're doing is not good. Moses' father-in-law said to him, you will certainly wear out both yourself and those people who... Because the task is too heavy for you. You can't do it alone. See, it it wasn't that Moses was unfit to hear the disputes. No. It wasn't that he didn't care about their disputes. It wasn't that the job was beneath him. It wasn't that the people didn't want Moses to hear their disputes. It wasn't any of those things. The problem was simply that the job was too big for Moses to do alone. His time and energy were being spent unwisely. And therefore, justice was delayed for many of the Israelites. How are you currently spending your time and energy? I want you to think about that for a moment. How are you 
currently spending your time and energy. Moses needed to delegate. Just like we see in Acts chapter 6, verse 2 and 4, when the apostles insisted that they needed to delegate so that they could not leave the preaching and teaching of God's word. And there in Acts chapter 6, we see the appointment of the first deacons. It's because they delegated. They recognized that, listen, we need to spend our time and energy wisely. And so, much to Moses' credit, we see that he was both humble and teachable. He was both humble and teachable when Jethro said, what you're doing is not good. Moses was all ears. He, he, he didn't go, how, how dare you ask me? Who are you? Can you not see great responsibility that God has given me? No, no, no. He goes, okay, I'm ready to listen. Clearly you have a word for me. Moses knew how not to bow to the complaints of the children of Israel. See, we saw this in Exodus 17 verse 3. But also he knew how to hear godly counsel from a man like Jethro. He, he could distinguish the two. He knew the difference. There are complaints and then there is wisdom. And sometimes, sometimes they sound the same. We need to be able to discern. And you know, if you're in a position of leadership, I'm preaching to the choir. Be humble and teachable. That's who God uses. Verse 19, now listen to me. I will give you some advice. Here comes the wisdom. And God be with you. You be the one to represent the people before God and bring their cases to him. Instruct them about the statutes and the laws and teach them the way to live and what they must do. He says, you be the one to represent the people before God. See, this was the first essential step in effective delegation for Moses. He had to pray for the people. Moses had to bring the difficulties of the people to God. Prayer was an essential aspect of Moses' leadership for the people. Prayer is essential. Praying for the people that you lead. It is essential for any leader of God's people. If you are not submitting to someone who prays, you need to consider your submission. That that person is praying, praying for themselves, praying for you, laying it all before the Father. And so you are the one to represent the people before God in prayer. Verse 20, then you are to instruct them about the statutes and laws. Teach them the way to live and what they must do. See, for Moses to effectively lead and delegate, he had to teach the word of God not only to those who would hear the disputes, but also those who might have disputes. As much as you think people need better strategies, better policies, better systems, better plans, and all of those things are good, they need the Word of God. Over and above all those things, we need the Word of God. We, we don't need another great Instagram meme or a sound bite or a really cool quote we need the word of God because it's, it's true it's, it's living, it's active it transforms it engages, it heals it restores it reconciles I say this often, that the South African Constitution is amazing for a number of reasons. It's not perfect, but it's amazing. But those words cannot do what these words can do. 
We need the Word of God. And, and there's this growing culture today that's kind of pushing this to the and saying, no, 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 it's about what you feel. What do you feel? Now, I'm not saying that your feelings are not important. I'm saying your feelings submit to the Word of God. Instruct them, Jethro says. If the people knew God's word for themselves, many disputes would be settled immediately. Not just disputes. I believe many other things in life would be settled. All the questions that you have, if you knew God's word, I believe they would be settled. But because we've pushed it to the side, we go to all different places to find the answers. Instruct them, Jethro says. Now I believe in what Jethro gives Moses. There is a clear analogy between the leadership of Moses for Israel and the leadership of a pastor of a local church. The analogy does not fit at every point, but it does in many aspects. So let's run through them real quick. Number one. First and foremost, God is to be recognized as the true leader of the people. First and foremost. That God is the true leader of the people. Not a man, not a woman. God is. And all of us should be, should be pointing people to that God. In everything that we do. In our serving, in our teaching, in our giving... God is the true leader. That's number one. Number two, the leader could not do the work of leadership alone. No one can. We were not created to live in isolation. We were created for fellowship, even in our leading. Third one is the leader had a special responsibility for prayer and teaching. Much, much of my role is praying praying for myself, praying for my family, praying for you. And God knows I could do this more. But I do it as much as I can when I'm, I'm driving in the car and I, and I think of you. I, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for your marriage. I'll pray for your work situation. I'll pray for whatever sin you're going through, whatever difficulty you're experiencing. Now, now I'm trying to do this thing where it's like I'm praying for you. Let me send you a text to let you know I'm thinking of you and praying for you. I could do that better. But the point is to pray. As much of my responsibility is doing that. And then, and then it's coming to God's word, seeking to understand it, first and foremost for my heart, so that I might be able to teach it to you. And so oftentimes... After service, folks will come to me and be like, oh, honor, that word was cutting. <laughs> and I'll, I'll go, thank you for saying that. I want you to know it cut me first throughout this week. There are moments sometimes where I read this and I go, ah, he's speaking about me. See, too often what we do is we read this and we go, so God, what do you want to say to them? No, 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 no. God, what are you saying to me? Come to the scriptures out of devotion. And then God will use that as you teach. The other thing that we see here that we could possibly connect from pastor to Moses, Moses to pastor, is that the leader was appointed and anointed by God. I've wrestled with this one for many years. If you know me well enough, you'll know this to be true. That God really hasn't called me to this. That I'm, I'm in this for a while. I'm, I'm filling in a seat for that person who God will call. And, and God the whole time going, no, I've, I've called you. I've appointed you. And if I've appointed you, then I've anointed you. And, and not, this is not just for someone who stands up on a Sunday and preaches, but it's for every single person who has crossed the line of faith. God has appointed you and anointed you for a specific task. Don't doubt that. 
And if you're wrestling, then get around some wise counsel and ask some questions. Here's what I'm feeling. Do you, do, you, do you think that that's true? Do you believe it to be true? Are you seeing it in my life? God appoints and he anoints. A leader must select, train, and give authority to others to help in the work. It's one of the roles of a pastor. We started this church with a handful of people in the living room. And we've watched over the years God multiply and multiply and multiply, not just here, but beyond this community. As he plants two churches in different parts of the city. And so from the very beginning, my role has always been to select and train and equip and send out. Select and train and equip and send out. If many people are fearful of losing power, and so they don't select, they don't train, they don't equip, they don't send out. That power doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. It's God's power. This is why when we plant churches, we send out our best. We stand here and we go, if you feel that God is calling you to go, then go. Guys, you don't think that it doesn't hurt when I see friends and people that I have, I have walked journeys with go, yeah, I think I'm going to go. Go. Go in the grace of God. Verse 21. But you should select from all the people able men, God-fearing, trustworthy, and hating dishonest, dishonest prophet. Place them over people as commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They should judge the people at all times. Then they can bring you every major case, but judge every minor case themselves. In this way, you will lighten your load, and they will bear it with you. This was the next step in effective delegation for Moses. See, delegation fails if the job is not put into the hands of able, godly men. Men of ability. This is able men. Friends, they just they have to be able to do the work. Men of godliness. These are men who fear God more than they fear men or other people. It's not easy sometimes when we make decisions and you go, man, this is, this is not going to end well. It's not going to land well. It's a, they're not going to hear it well. It's not going to be received well. But you know what? We have to do it because we fear God. That's who Jethro says that you should appoint. I'm not trying to get likes. Men of God's Word, men of truth, men who know the Bible. Read your Bible. And men of honor. These are individuals who are about the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Satan. There are way too many people leading churches who have appointed themselves as prophets so that they can make profit. We're to call these men out. These men are not about the kingdom of God. And so Jethro says to Moses, be careful, be careful, be careful. Moses had to fulfill one of the critical functions of a leader, to develop and implement new Leaders. Paul gave the same counsel to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. It says, And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. For Moses to effectively delegate, he still had to have oversight. Accountability is key. Not control. Delegation is the exercise of leadership. It's not the abandoning of leadership. In this way, Jethro says, you will lighten your load 
and they will bear it with you. Verse 23, if you do this and God so directs you, that's what Jethro says, if you do this and God so directs you, see Jethro knew that his advice came from outside the community of Israel. He's not an Israelite. And so he recognizes that. That this school of thought was from down south. A council that some might say of African nature. And so he says to him, hey, I need you, I need you to, to hear what I'm saying, but then I need you to go to God. He was careful to say to Moses, I want you to go and search the Lord's wisdom. Hear me out, but go search the Lord's wisdom and discern that this is the right thing to do. Take all that wise counsel that is offered and then we're to do what? To line it up with the scriptures. This is not just for Moses, but this is for us. Friends, I want you to be good Bereans. Even here at Rooted Fellowship, I want you to be good Bereans. Acts chapter 17, from verses 10, it says, That very night the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Be good Bereans. Guys, I don't mind, I don't mind if you come to me and go, oh, no, I disagree with everything that you said. And then, and then go like this. Because in the word of God, it actually says, I'll buy you the lunch and let's sit down and chat. But don't go, oh, no, I don't like what you said. Why? Because I just I didn't feel it. You, you didn't feel it. Yeah, I, did, I just didn't, I didn't feel it. I, have, I, I don't know where to begin. Because I can't get inside your mind. I can't get inside your feelings. I, I don't know what the rules of engagement are. They can change like the wind does. But this never changes. It's true yesterday. It's true today. It'll be true tomorrow. Countless men and women have held this in their hands and have taught it and shared it with others and lives have been transformed. So friends, please be a good Berean. Please be a good Berean. I'm thankful that many of you trust me, but be a good Berean. And that's what Jethro says to Moses. Hear me out, but then go to the Lord. You will be able to endure if you put this into practice. And if the Lord finds this to be good and right for you, then, then you will be able to endure. And also these people will be able to go home satisfied. See, the first benefit of effective delegation is this. Moses would enjoy life more and be able to do his job better than ever, avoiding the exhaustion of having to settle every single dispute. You'll live longer. You see your kids grow up. You see your grandkids. The second benefit is this. The people would be better served. How crazy is that? You're telling me that if I give away, if I give away leadership, the people will be better served? Yes. That's exactly what Jethro is saying. The people don't have to come and see you. Because it's not about you. At any moment, God could take you from this earth. Then what? The people will be better served. There is a saying that justice delayed is justice denied. And if you're the only person that is judging over these disputes, justice will be delayed. Verse 24, Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. So Moses chose able men from all Israel and made them leaders over the people as commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They judged the people at all times. They would bring the hard cases to Moses, but they would judge every minor case themselves. Friends, what we see in Exodus 18 is that God 
taught Moses by someone from the outside. And Moses listened. Moses wisely followed Jethro's counsel and surely this extended his ministry and made him more effective. In Moses' method of administration, we see here in his appointing and then giving instructions on what they are to do, we see that some had higher positions than others. Some were commanders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. But, but hear this. God blessed the faithful service of the leaders of tens as much as the service of the leaders of thousands. Can we stop trying to compete with our brothers and sisters? Because when we do that, then envy sets in. Bitterness sets in. Jealousy sets in. Then we take our eyes off what God has called us to do and now we're looking over the fences because we believe that it's greener on the other side. God blesses the faithful service of the leaders of tens as much as the service of the leaders of thousands. This speaks to the fact that God has gifted us differently. We are all equal created in the image of God, that that salvation comes to us and we are now children of God, that we, we sit at the table as equals, but God has uniquely deposited into us different gifts with different abilities. Now, this is not a sermon about gifts I don't have time, but, but, but if you, you want to go home and be a good Berean, go look at Romans chapter 12. Then look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Then Ephesians chapter 4. Then 1 Peter chapter 4. That's where we see the gifts in the New Testament. And you'll see how diverse they are. And it's God who gives. Not you and I, but God who gives. We'll quickly see that there's three types of gifts. There's serving gifts and speaking gifts and supernatural gifts. And we believe all of them. We believe in every single one. Here at Rooted Fellowship, we believe in all of them. Serving gifts, it's like mercy. And leadership and administration. That some of you have this gift. And not just one, we have many. The question is, are you using it? For the flourishing of God's kingdom or are you keeping it for yourself? Speaking gifts like preaching and teaching. Encouraging. Right there sits the son of encouragement. That's what we call him. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. You you don't have to be around Jonah too long to, to feel encouraged. He's using it for the benefiting and the flourishing of this community. Supernatural gifts. Prophecy. Healing. And the interpretation of tongues. We believe in all of them. And if you're sitting here trying to figure out, no, well, then what's my, I don't know what mine is. Let let me give a plug. It's called discipleship. Get in a discipleship group. Get around some people who are going to love you and care for you and and lead you to God and and, and help you unearth some of those gifts and and go, yeah, 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 I can see you really want a teaching gift. But let me tell you, that's a, it's probably a private gift. That's just something that you do privately. It's, it's, it's not a public gift. Okay, maybe, that's, maybe I've gone too far. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll use myself. Singing. I believe I have the gift of singing. It's a private gift. I sing in the shower. I sing in the car. And I sing around the table with my family. And I, yo, I use that gift to the glory of God. It's not a public gift. I think we should sit for a moment and ask the question, God, how have you uniquely gifted me for the benefit of this body, which is for the benefit of the kingdom, for your glory and for the ultimate joy of your people? Some thousands, some tens. You might have the same gift, but God goes, no, no, you're great at leading 30 people. You're great at leading 200 people. It is better to set a hundred men to work than to do the work of a hundred men. 
D.L. Moody said. This church needs all of us. Every single one of us. Because I believe that God has uniquely gifted you. And he has deposited in you a beautiful gift. And we need a Jethro to come and tell us this. Not just here at Rooted Fellowship, not just here in Pretoria, not just here in South Africa, but I believe here on the African continent. Take it like this. It's an African speaking to Africans. Sent by God. To say that we matter, that we have value. Too often, too often, we find ourselves that way and this way, believing that the grass is greener somewhere else. That we have nothing to offer. No, 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 we do. We do. We, we, how much time do I, yeah, I'm going to rant a little bit. Um, we, we are a, we may be a poor, we're not a poor continent. We're a continent that has poor people. But we're not a poor continent. We, we need to get this out of our minds. We're a continent that, that has been exploited both from outside and inside. There's internal corruption. There's bad governance. There's, there's so, so much that has led us to this. And all of this, all of this is sin. All of it is sin. And so before we start pointing fingers, it's sin. Point the finger at sin. Which tells us that all of us are in desperate need of a savior. That all of us need to repent and believe, to trust in Jesus first and foremost and then for those who've crossed the line of faith for those who call themselves children of God we then go okay God what have you placed in my hands so that I might serve you and glorify you for the benefit of your kingdom and your people let's get to work friends because I don't believe that this is the dark continent yes we may have dark complexions but we are not the dark continent God uses people from this continent. It's here in the text. He still uses people from this continent. Don't count yourself out. That what we need might be sitting in you right now, right now, in this very moment. And God is just saying, will you trust and believe? But I don't, I, don't, I don't have all the resources that... No, 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 no. Everything that you need, I've placed in you. Let's get to work. I will place you in a community where the other gifts that you don't have will come around you. I could say more on this, but let me close. Verse 27. Moses let his father-in-law go and he journeyed to his own land. And just like a ninja... In the same way that he showed up, he then leaves. I love that about Jethro. He's like, I've done my bit. Zipporah and the kids are here. I'm gone. And he goes home. I'm thankful that we have trusted in God in the way that he has shaped and molded this church and how he has brought different people with unique gifts to this church and how people have stepped up and are now in positions of leadership and how we're discipling people and we're seeing the next generation and guys I'm, I'm so excited now we haven't done it perfectly I know that but I'm excited about what God has done thus far and I'm, I'm man I am walking in expectation of what he will do my question to you is are you have you given up or are you going you know what God is still at work. Be because even this church, six, seven years ago, we were told that this would never happen. Never happen. That just, just, just down the road, da da now we're going to get me super emotional here, but just, just down the road was, was a building that we wanted. It was the first building that we approached and we just felt like God was calling us to this area that this, this was a unique, strategic area in the city. The University of Pretoria is right here. There's a whole leadership pipeline close to the Gau train, the transportation hub that connects. I mean, strategic. And we went there and we were like, 
man, it just feels like God's opening this door, God's opening this door, God's opening this door, and we have the door shut in our face. And I was told, I won't give you the reason, or I won't tell you the story, I'll give you, uh, let me summarize it for you. We couldn't get the space because of the color of my skin. I wanted to give up. True story. I was like, oh, you know what, mates? We shouldn't do this. God continues to work. And sure, we ended up at another location. You know, we never signed a contract. Some of you guys know New Hope School. That's where we were for, what, five, five or so years? Never signed a contract. I love that school. I love every single person there. I love, I love the leadership. We, we, man, it's, we have such a great relationship. Right, Jonah? Such a great re- relationship. I mean, they were sad when we told them we needed to leave. And we needed to leave because we just couldn't meet. But they were sad. But you know why we didn't sign a contract? Because they wanted to have the ability to kick us out at any moment. And we stayed and God grew and God multiplied. We persevered. Eventually when we landed this, when I stand up at the office, I can actually see the building from the window. Ha <laughs> ha. Look at God. God was like, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not done with you yet. Are you humble? Are you teachable? Let's get to work. I have placed in you gifts that when you come around other gifts who are humble and teachable, watch me work. We planted two churches in a pandemic. I can tell you story after story after story of churches that are shut, that shut down in this pandemic. And we plant two churches in a pandemic. Guys, this is, I'm not saying, look at Orne, this, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, look at God. When people are just going, you know, we're going to pause for a moment. We're going to wait out the pandemic. We're going to wait out the lockdown restrictions. Then we'll get to work. God is like, what? Wait for What? We have everything that we need sitting here in this very room. I believe that. To start schools, to start businesses, to transform communities, to engage in the political arena, to change laws, all for the glory of God. We have it here. The question is, are you willing? Will we heed the wide counsel? of our African brother Jethro. And so, Father God, I I come asking that our hearts truly would be open to you. That even though we recognize the multiple challenges and, and, and and what we have in front of us, sometimes just it, it feels like there's no ways that we can get through. Lord, I pray that we would recognize that we operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, you break down barriers. You provide in ways that we could have never, ever thought of. You multiply when people are going, no, 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 no. don't do anything. Lord, I pray for every single person here that, that they would have a, a desire, Lord, a desire to serve you. And in doing so, that, that, that gifts that have laid dormant would come alive. That they are serving gifts in here, teaching gifts in here, healing gifts in here, leadership gifts in here. Lord, would you multiply them? All for your glory and for the furthering of your kingdom because it's through the church, God, you say. Through the church, your manifold wisdom will be put on display. And the church is not this building. It's not any building. The church is your people. We gather to be encouraged and to love and to serve one another. And then we scatter to be salt and light. 
Grant us favor. We ask all of this in your beautiful name. Amen.